Hey guys, how are you going? My name is Dom and today I'm going to be responding to some of your comments which you've left me over the past few months. If today's video helps you out, please drop a like, I'll definitely appreciate it and if you're new around here, consider subscribing, I'll make plenty of web development tutorials. Let's jump into the first question here, or the first comment, which says, Everything works but the content. I'm having an error that states cannot read property class list of null. The reason for this error is because you're trying to do something on null. Okay, and as we know, null means nothing, so you can't, for example, uh, you know, access the class list property on null. It doesn't make sense. So, why do you have null in the first place? Well, in this case right here, you're most likely trying to do something with an HTML element, which means it's likely that you've misspelled the ID or the class name inside your get element by ID or query selector function. So double check your ID and class name spelling inside those functions if you're using those. If this right here doesn't fix your problem, it may be because you've got your JavaScript uh, script tag inside the head of your HTML. And the reason why that causes problems is because you're trying to do things on an element which does not yet exist. So when your HTML loads up, your head is going to run first and it's going to run your JavaScript inside there. So if it's trying to do things on an object or element which is not yet loaded, okay, because the body comes after the head, then you're going to get this error also. So to fix that problem, just move your script tag from inside your head to the bottom of your body. If you want to be super secure, then you can take advantage of the DOM content loaded JavaScript event, which just is going to fire off whenever uh, the DOM is uh, is fully loaded. The next one here says, instead of doing dot parent element, dot parent element, dot parent element, uh, just do header cell dot closest th. This one here is referring to a table, in particular, a table header or th um, element. In this video, I've got some sort of nested element inside my th, uh, you know, cell. All right, so I've got, for example, a div, which then has a span, which then might have an I tag or something like that. So I wanted to basically start from my innermost nested element, for example, a span, and then go up to a th. I've said dot parent element, dot parent element, dot parent element to reach, you know, um, the actual th there. There's a much better solution to doing that, and that is using the closest method. So the closest method allows you to pass in an element, for example, th, and then it's going to basically start at your target. So in this case, for example, the span, and then go up until it finds the closest th and that right there is going to, you know, make it selected. It's going to get that one for you and return it so you can then do things on that TH. So that is definitely a better technique. So thank you for this comment. I am now doing this in all my future videos. The next one says, can't we say if target is equal to ally instead of saying target matches ally? This one here is referring to an event listener and grabbing the target from the event object. So basically just trying to check that tag name of ally. Um, and uh, here in this comment, if you just say target is equal to ally, that right there is trying to compare an HTML element object with a string of ally. So that is not going to work. Um, instead, you need to say target.matches and what the matches method does is it just checks if the target element, okay, if that element uh, matches the CSS selector which you pass in. So in this case here, I'm passing in ally and much like CSS, ally refers to a list item, okay, so that's just the tag name. So it's just checking if your target element has ally as its tag name and that is why that is required and not the string comparison, um, you know, in the first case there. The next one says, what's the difference with var and let and why is let better than var? So let is better than var because it's just a bit tighter. So it helps you write better code. Now, one of the significant changes or differences between var and let is the scoping. Okay, so if, for example, you've got an if statement, okay, inside your if statement between your two opening and closing curly braces, if you were to write var a is equal to 10, okay, then outside of your if statement, if you try to access a, 
it's going to work, you're going to get 10. Now, in comparison with let's, if you do the same thing, you say let A equals 10 in your if statement, outside of that if, A is not going to be accessible. And that is because let only exists within the block that you declare it in. A can't escape those, uh, those curly braces when using let, but with var, it can. So var is function scoped. So the variable is going to exist throughout your entire function as opposed to the entire block with let. Definitely use let. There is almost no reason to use var anymore in 2021. And the last one here says, how do I incorporate semi-bold 600 italic into the body and then regular 400 into H1 and H2? So the reason why I chose this question is because it relates to the usage of custom fonts. And if you don't get this right, then you run the risk of having different results on different operating systems or browsers. For example, on you know Apple Mac, your web page might look different than Windows because um, you didn't load up a font correctly or something like that. So I want to shed some light on using custom fonts correctly. But just to answer this question specifically, what I recommend you do is that you set a base font in your body. For example, if you want a 500 font weight in your body, that is your base. So you say body font weight 500 font family this and font size of 16 for example then in everything else that you want to be different um, just specify it so for example in your h1 and h2 just say you know font weight 400 so that way you've got your base in your body and then everything else needs to be explicitly specified and that gives you the most robust result and there we go so that is all of the comments for today's video if you've got any more comments questions or queries leave them below i'll try my best to answer them and potentially include them in the next installment of whatever I decide to, you know, name this series. If today's video helped you out, leave a like, I'll appreciate it and subscribe. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video.